Man, what's up, church? It is so good to be in the house. It is cold outside, and unfortunately, my voice, when it's cold, likes to try to go back to sleep. And so my voice is a little crazy today. I promise I'm not sick. It's just I'm getting hoarse, and that's what I do when it's cold. But I'm so glad you are in the house. I'm so thankful that we get to be here together. I was reading this week in our Bible reading plan, and I read this in Psalm 33, verse 4. For the word of the Lord is right and true. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. I'm so thankful that not only is the Lord faithful, but his word that we get to lean into every single Sunday and every single day of the week gets to lead us and take us in the right direction, and we can know we can trust it even when we may not be able to trust anything else. We are in week two of our series entitled Wine and Dine. We're in this relationship series as we're walking through marriage and relationships. And I'm excited because it's February. And as you guys know, today is what? Valentine's Day. Now, let me just ask you a question. And you can raise your hand. I like, I like participation. So how many of you actually participate in Valentine's Day? You do something great. And how many of you think it's absolutely ridiculous? Great. Okay, perfect. Well, at our house, we think it's ridiculous only because I think it's just another way that Allison is trying to get me to spend my money. You know what I'm saying? And I'm tight. But, uh, man, I love... I love being able to be with you guys. It is Valentine's Day. I love my family, and I love you, my faith family, and I'm so honored to be here. We are going to continue. Again, we're in week two. We're going to talk about part of the scripture that I left out this past week. So let me just say this. If you missed last week, would you do me a favor and go back and listen to the service? You can watch it on YouTube. You can even watch it on Facebook, but it was very, very instrumental and foundational to these next two weeks. And so please go back and watch online. If you're joining in with us right now online, do me a favor and like and share this message. Again, I believe God's word is true and his word is taking us into places that we desire and want to be, not only as individuals, but as families. And I know that today is no different than any other Sunday that his word is good and his word is for us and our community. Let me tell you a story to set up our time today as we're going to be leaning into God's word, particularly in a text, in a a small portion of the text that is to what Paul is writing to husbands, okay? So let me tell us a story. And really, it's a story about my dad. You guys know my dad died three years ago. And uh, I love my dad. I miss my dad so much. But I thought that as I'm setting up our time, I would share with you a little bit about my dad. When I was a kid, my dad and I didn't always get along. Uh, I was what they would call an aggressive, uh, full of myself young man. My dad was real laid back. Uh, As I got older, my aggressiveness became what we would call passion. when, When situations would be crazy, I would be very passionate, very aggressive, my dad, regardless of the situation, would be cool as a cucumber. You know what I'm saying? And he was always laid back. Well, what that translated to, because I was always passionate and aggressive, my dad was always laid back. Sometimes my dad and I had difficulty understanding one another, the methods that we communicated. And so when I was a kid, my mom and I would, would communicate, and she's my, a lot like me. She's very aggressive, very passionate. And so my mom and I would be in these conversations that that we thought were normal, but my dad would almost get offended like he thought I was blessing my mama out. You hear what I'm saying? Now, and here's what I want you to hear me say. Why am I telling you this? Because as a kid, I never questioned my dad's love for my mom. I never questioned. I sometimes questioned his methods in relating to me. But I never questioned his love for my mom. I never questioned that he wanted to be the greatest biblical man that he could be. I never questioned 
how he related to my mom because I saw him consistently work and live with toughness and tenderness towards her. And men, I want to say this to you. As a man, it is okay to be tough, and sometimes our men need to be more tough. But it is also okay to be tender. And I want to say this to you. Sometimes our men need to be a little bit more tender. There's a balance that we need to be as man. And so as we are leaning into this scripture today, we're really leaning into the thought of being tough and also being tender. Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, not just to men, not just to women, but to the church because Paul wants the church to understand relationships, but he also wants the men in the church to understand their role. Are you following what I'm saying? And so he begins to talk with them in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 28, all about being a man and understanding the relationship that men have with their wives, but also that he has with the church. I wrote this last week. I said this to you. I want to say it again. The relationship between Jesus and the church speaks to us about the husband and wife relationship. And the marriage relationship between a man and a woman speaks to us about the relationship between Jesus and his people. So when I'm reading you this text here in just a moment, in Ephesians chapter 5, 25 through 28. I, I want you to hear this, men, as, as our attitudes towards our wives. Women, I want you to see this as how a biblical man acts. And so you can begin to pray for your man and for the men in your life. But all of us can look at this and learn about Jesus' relationship with us, his people. And this is what Paul says to the church at Ephesus. Are you with me? about relationships and understanding man's role to his spouse, but also understanding Jesus' role to the church. And this is what he says, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. That's what this is, the Bible, the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Who who loves his wife loves himself. The title of today's message is this, A Lesson on Manhood. Are you with me? A Lesson on Manhood. Here's the thing. And then I'm going to pray for our time, and I'm going to let Terry Jamison, high school principal, come up and give a better message than I could ever give on toughness and tenderness. Uh, here's the theme, the truth for today. A man that doesn't know who he is in Christ won't know how to act in his marriage. A man who doesn't know who he is in Christ won't know how to act in his marriage. Let me pray for us, and then... Brother Terry, why don't you come on up and give us a word. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. I'm just so thankful that, Lord, even in, you shows us in your foreknowledge, you knew I was going to have voice problems and struggle, and you already had it set up long ago. And so, Lord, there's just so many affirmations for me that today is the day that you want your servant, Terry, to speak to us about toughness and tenderness. And, Lord, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, that, that, Lord, you would prepare the men's hearts that are in the room, but also the men that will be watching online. Lord, you desire for men to live biblically and to be a man of faith and character and integrity. And so, Lord, I thank you that not only is that your desire, but you make it so if we desire that to be for our lives. And so, God, I pray for Terry. I thank you for him. And, Lord, I pray right now that you would speak through him in a mighty way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, thanks. Mylon, hear me okay? Okay, uh, I'm, I had a thought just a second ago about, uh, since he said I was a high school principal, I wanted to start out by telling you real quick that I had somebody one time come up to me and say, hey, don't you think we ought to have prayer in the school? And I said, absolutely not. Why would you do that? Why would you impose your faith on somebody else? Why don't you just model it? 
Think about that for a second. I consider myself uh, a faithful man, and I wish that I could pray in school. I wish that we could get up every morning and have a worship service at 7.30 before we start classes. We can't. But we can model it. We can model it, and then people will follow the model. They don't follow what's imposed on them. Nobody does, nor you or I. So what I'm about to share with you about manhood was not modeled for me. So a lot of men in this room may be able to relate. Some of you may not. I know that perhaps if I heard my son say, no one modeled it for me, it would break my heart. But the truth is, no one modeled it for me. So I had to find it somewhere, and I found it in Scripture. I found it in God. I didn't realize it when I was a kid, maybe. So I want you to start by, if you can we pull that verse up again by chance? Are we able to do that? And then I also want you to be thinking about a verse in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, and I want you to focus on the word nothing. So if you have your Bible and you have some way to look that up on your phone, whatever you use for uh, Scripture, look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, and focus on the word nothing. And then when you look at this one, focus on the word holy, okay? So what I'm about to do, I'm sure is going to make my wife very uncomfortable, but she deserves it. I'm going to talk to you from a point of view of a man who is hopelessly and incandescently in love, if you've ever seen Pride and Prejudice. So there you go. I'm a sucker for romantic movies. I do cry, and I do believe in her being holy. So I'm also one of these guys that I don't mince words, and it's tough to make me believe things. I'm a cynic. So if you are in need of counseling, do not come see me, okay? Because if I, I say this jokingly, my, my dear friend Matthew, but when you're talking about anger issues last week or somebody's talking about something that they have an issue with, I'm very likely to say, well, stop doing it. That's the only counseling advice I have for you. Why are you doing it? So I'm not any good at that. I look at Scripture and I say to myself, I'm going to take it serious. I know a lot of people that study the Bible, they talk the Bible, they're students of the Bible, and they're serious about the Bible, but then I, I want to throw in this question, but do you take it serious? Okay? I know I can go to Barnes & Noble, and I can pick out so many versions of Scripture that I can, I can become confused about the interpretation of it. I can say, well, what does it really mean? I mean, there's so many different interpretations. There's so many different denominations of churches. What's the truth for crying out loud? Okay, so I'm just going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to immerse myself just in this moment right here, okay? Holy. I grew up in a generation where men called women the old lady. Anybody relate? That'll give away how old I was. They're the old lady. I grew up in a generation where that 90% of boys were unscrupulous thugs and they spent all their time telling dirty jokes about women or talking about somebody else's girlfriend or sister. And it was always as an object. And I didn't participate and I thought that made me weak. One of the reasons why is, is because my, I watched how my precious mother was, cheat, uh, was treated when I was growing up. And I could never understand how any man could treat a woman that way. Holy, holy. Here's the way it is in my household, and not because I'm some champion, because the last thing I wanted was for you to go get in your car today and get in an argument, one of you say to the other, well, am I like that guy? This is not my intention, so I'm giving you this disclaimer. When you drive off, I am not responsible for what occurs in your car. All I can do is just be truthful with you and tell you my viewpoint of the queen of Taz. She is the queen of the Terry Autonomous Zone. And that I wanted my daughters to see that. The most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life was my wife pregnant with my children. I've never seen anything that was so radiant, that was so filled with light as her carrying our children. So whenever she was gaining weight and going through all the phases and both mental and physical, I was sitting over there going, oh my gosh, what, what's more spectacular than this? Well, what's more spectacular is, is that 
now in her mid-50s, she's more beautiful than she was when she was 18 or 19 when I met her. She's holy. Every morning when I get out of bed and my foot hits the ground, the first thing I think of is Jill. Not myself, not my job, not breakfast, not anything else, Jill. If she gets up before me, it is the most marvelous thing in all of creation just to watch her get ready for the day, to make noise and racket and force me to wake up, right? To go in the bathroom and to go through a ritual that I can't even begin to relate to, to get ready for just a day, when all I really require is a warm wash rag and my clothes. But it is a spectacular, holy thing. When I see my daughters, I see the soul of their mother in her eyes, each one of them, Jessica and Madison. When I see my son, I hope that he can see the spectacular spirit in his mother. You see, when I read this Bible verse, I ask myself, men, and I want us to challenge ourselves, challenge your belief system for once in your life. Don't believe everything you see. How's global warming working for you today? When you wake up tomorrow, don't just believe whatever Rachel Maddow says or whatever Sean Hannity says, for crying out loud. Believe the Bible and take it serious for once. As a man, stand up for what is right and believe it and live it. So when I read these verses, I don't, I don't walk away from them and go, hmm, I wonder what the interpretation of that scripture just might be. Fixate on the word holy and ask yourself as a man in this room right now, whether you are married, single, have a girlfriend, I don't care. Do you look at women as holy? Do you? I tell my wife this a lot. In the world of the man kingdom, you're either in the 90% or the 10%. And I want you to ask yourself which one you are. The 10% looks at women as holy. The 10% is likely to never say a derogatory word or participate in an off-color joke about women, to crack jokes about them, to make them objects, to fixate on them as objects. The old lady, what's in it for me? If you're not in the 10% and you're in the 90%, I would challenge you to pick yourself up and move over and ask yourself, what your son is subjected to every day of his life. You know, 25 years ago, I predicted the Me Too movement. I was teaching a psychology class or an educational psychology class, and I looked right at my students and I said, you have no idea where the pendulum is about to swing. Women are going to get fed up with this nonsense. You can't spend eternity treating them as second-class citizens. It's going to swing the other way. Culture is going to change. When it happened and we were all just in awe, I was sitting over here grinning. I told you so. You can't behave that way and think that an entire generation of women weren't going to rebel. I predicted it. Why? So here's the cut down, man. I'm sorry. This is a halftime speech. You're not playing very well. Okay? We brought this on ourselves. Because we haven't looked at women as holy. Go back to the very beginning of what I said a while ago. One of the reasons why I've never been an advocate for prayer in school is because we shouldn't be in, imposing our Christian values on people. We should be living them and modeling them so that they look at us and go, wow, they're, they're up to something good. I think I want to follow them. I think I want to know more about this Jesus Christ. Now, if you've got your Bibles, and you can go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, have you found the word nothing yet? When I got out of bed this morning, I asked my wife, who I consider to be a biblical scholar, for crying out loud, she is a student of the, of the Bible, I asked her to look up the word nothing and tell me, what do you think it means? And she explained it to me. 
And in that passage past the word nothing, you'll see the word servant. Everybody see that? Okay. So I'm going to ask the men in this room, you think Jesus was a man's man? I got, I, I, and if you do, before you say yes, I think I have some reality checks for you here, okay? Jesus was not a cast member in Saving Private Ryan. He did not take the beach at Normandy, okay? He wasn't riding a horse in a Clint Eastwood movie. He didn't pull a six-shooter on anybody. He didn't get in a bar fight in Roadhouse, okay? He was a servant. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippians made it abundantly clear that he made himself what? Nothing. That's kind of a hard word to attach to the Savior of humanity. Pause for just a minute. As I like to say to students sometimes, let that sink in. Just wrap your brain around that concept if you can. Nothing. The Savior of the human race an entity so magnificent that he's called the Son of God, that he walked on water, the Apostle Paul described him as nothing. So I ask all the men in the room, is it possible that you could make yourself nothing to a woman? Read into that what you want. Get in the car, argue, drive home, say, well, that's not what it really means. When I get home, I'm going to look up. It can't really mean nothing. Look, I, as my wife and I were discussing this morning, the Apostle Paul is responsible for, at least in substance, the bulk of the New Testament. Okay? And it was all in letters to people. Letters to people about his love for Christ, his unbelievable, unwavering respect for Christ, and yet he described him as nothing. So there are three words that I want you to leave with today attached to manhood. Holy, servant, and nothing. Okay? By the way, I would have brought a PowerPoint presentation. I would have bought a, a Google document, whatever. But that's a condition called Microsoftitis, and I don't have it. That's one of the reasons why I'm retiring from education is because that's how I know that I'm, I'm in my own living, you know what, is somebody that builds Google documents and sends them to me in emails or gigantic attachments and what they've done is overcomplicated, a simple thing. When all they had to do, it's like text messaging. I've never been able to understand. Why don't you just call me? Is it really necessary to text me a mile-long message when all you had to do was just pick the phone up and go, hey, Terry, how's it going? And I could go, great, how are you? All right? And that could be a sign of old age. But those three words are attached to manhood. So now what I'm about to do here, and I'm going I'm to take the next six or seven minutes and wrap this up. What I want you to do is I want you to look at your daughters, your sisters, your wives, and I want you to ask yourself, are you living that way? You know, there's probably some people that are watching me right now on Facebook. It got shared, but here, here are the memories that I have of men's men, and they probably don't even realize that the greatest qualities they had were those moments where they made themselves nothing. <clears throat> How many of you ever look back on school, sports, coaches, life, whatever, and you say to yourself, I remember that guy being intimidating. You know, the way he walked the hallways, the way he acted, whether it was a coach or teacher, whatever it was. Well, I, I'm thinking of my high school baseball coach today, Joy Sample. One of the most important things that he did for me was be kind to me. I remember the kindness that he demonstrated toward me when I was a mixed up youngster who had no male role models. He was very kind to me. Later on in life, when I went through the State Police Academy in Arkansas and I had a, a short stint as an Arkansas State Trooper, I remember the the meanest, most powerful man in the academy, the drill sergeant that was trying to make me a man, toward the end of the academy, tied my tie for me. He, he put his hands on my shoulders. He reached across me and he tied my tie. And I remember how important it is to be loved by a man. I never felt loved by a man when I was growing up. 
I don't know what that feels like. And so as I got older, I felt fatherless because I could not relate to biblical scripture identifying God as my father. Because when I get up in the morning, I'm not feeling those hands on my shoulder to help me tie my tie. I'm not feeling that coach that says, hey, I believe in you. But gradually as I've gotten older and I have my wife as a witness, I feel loved by God. I feel like I am fathered by God. And so what better compliment can I give God than to take care of his daughter? I call Jill God's daughter. So when I get out of bed in the morning, I have to resist the temptation to have a momentary worship service of her. I have to put it in perspective. I am the luckiest man alive that she calls me husband. You can bet the following. She is always going to get the last bite at Andy's. Okay? We are always going to order for her first. I am always going to park the car in the driveway so that her door is closest to the front door. I am never going to enter a, a dwelling ahead of her. If she wants to hold my hand, that's fine. If, by chance, I wake up tomorrow and she can never physically give herself to me again and she's paralyzed from the neck down and she can't even go to the bathroom without me doing it for her, I will rejoice at the privilege to pick her up out of a chair or a bed and carry her anywhere in the house and lay her down gently, wipe off her mouth, feed her, whatever, because she is holy. If you don't feel that way about your wife, even about your daughters, for crying out loud, come over to the 10%. Lead by example. Next week when my wife comes up here, she's going to talk about submissiveness and she's going to tell you that aspect of our relationship. Look, I'm okay with submitting to her. I know what Scripture says, but if the queen tells me that she needs something, I'm there. And I consider it honorable. I consider it the greatest privilege in life to serve her. I want you to ask yourself that when you leave today that when you are talking about God's daughter, that you don't feel that way. And if you don't, do a little self-inventory, guys. And by the way, ladies, I, with a couple minutes to go here, I probably shouldn't throw this out here because it's a little bit of a... It's okay to expect it. It's okay to want that. You should want that. You should want that for your daughters. Do you have any idea what it's like to go to my job every day and watch 470 kids learn how to be adults? Do you have any idea what that's like? Have you ever refereed a train wreck? Seriously. You don't understand the kids aren't the problem. You are. The kids have never been a problem to me. You are. Kids don't call me up on the phone and complain. You do. And if I model the behavior and I am respectful and kind to them, guess what they are back? Respectful and kind. I talk to kids as if they're going to be the 55-year-old adults they're going to be someday. I don't wag my finger in their face. At the end of the day, I hope that they see a man in me that is a sacrifice, that is a servant, that thinks women are holy, that makes himself nothing? I need you to embrace those concepts before you leave today because you're not a man's man because you're tough. Look, we can all go out in the parking lot and fight, and when it's over with, we're going to get arrested. There's not going to be any winner. We're going to look like a bunch of idiots. You're a man whenever you can resolve conflict with wisdom. You're a man whenever you say, not me, but you go first. How many of you ever seen the movie 
Amistad. You ever watch the movie Amistad? Rent it. Hey, step up and make yourself culturally aware of what's going on on the earth. Fox and CNN are not always right. In that movie Amistad, Cinque, the slave, was trying to relate to an attorney where he was from. And the attorney, played by Matthew McConaughey, couldn't understand his language, and they're going back and forth and talking over each other. And then in a moment of beautiful surrender, Cinque's character is in bondage. He takes a step back and just does this with his hands, as if to say, you go first. I had tears in my eyes. We can't communicate with one another or the rest of the world because we're so, blue, we're so busy running over each other. We don't hear another perspective. We can't believe anything unless it fits our agenda. It fits in our little module. And at the end of the day, men with your wife, shackle your hands and take a step back and just go, you first. You are first in everything that I do. You are first in my thoughts. You are first in my actions. You are first in my day. Look, I'm a strong believer in earning money and handing it to her. She manages it better than I do. But more importantly, hey, I want her to have the best clothes. I want her to have the best everything, period, zilch, nothing to talk about. I want her to feel like the queen of the Terry Autonomous Zone. For those of you that are not aware of what Taz is, I would challenge you to do some research. After the thing in Portland, I decided I was just going to create my own autonomous zone, and I have, and it's my house. So I haven't put up barricades or anything like that yet, but uh, I may someday. In closing, I want to tell you something. You fixate on that verse in Philippians about making yourself nothing. And, and dads, raise your hand in here if you're the dad of a son. Raise your hand if you got a boy. Okay. You know what was the number one thing I wanted my son to leave home with? And I asked him this when he grew up. After he graduated high school, I took a hold of him one day, and I said, were you ever afraid of me? Were you ever scared of me? And he said, no, Dad, I was never afraid of you. Mission accomplished. I wanted him to see that I was tender. I wanted him to watch me cry. I wanted him to watch me on bended knee to his mother. Mission accomplished. If you want to teach your son how to be a man, teach him to treat women as holy beings. Teach them to be servants. Teach them to make themselves nothing. And I promise you the world will follow. And, and by the way, men, we got to step up and do that. We have to step up. I'm, I'm, I'm fed up with the generation in which there is this, this unbelievable false equality that exists. We're only doing it for political correctness. We need to be the strengthened protectors of women with integrity and character, and they should follow because we have all those traits. That's what makes us role models. Be advised. You are not a man because you're tough. You're a man because you're weak. I, I, want, us to, I want us to pray together as we go out uh, from this service. And, and uh, Matthew, I appreciate you letting me talk. I hope, please, if there's any conflict in your cars on the way home, blame yourself. It's not my fault, okay? That's, a, that's also another lesson in manhood. It's accept responsibility for your own actions and don't blame Terry, Okay? And know this, my queen, my queen is my whole world. And someday, and this doesn't have to apply to you, I don't want it to, because we each have our own pathways. But hear me on this. This is how big of a deal she is. If I lose her today, before the day's out, no woman will ever share my bed again. I will pledge the rest of my life in honor of her memory and spend every waking minute of it with hers and my children. I will give my soul to her memory. I will give my life to what she has done for me. 
She deserves it because she is holy. Remember that, holy. Pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for church. We're grateful for the opportunity to be here, uh, to worship with freedom. And Lord, I just pray that every man in this room today leaves with the opinion that women are holy, that they are your daughters. They are spectacular. And I just pray that our minds are open to that. And we thank you so much for our blessings. And again, we thank you so much for this church. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Terry, thank you so much. What an incredible word. Love you, brother. I, I was taking notes. I knew a little bit about what he was going to say beforehand. I didn't know everything. But I wrote these two questions down. I just want to encourage you to... To ask yourself these questions as I will be asking and continuing to lean into this on my own. Can I make myself nothing to Allison? And do I treat her as holy? What an incredible word on how to be. I mean, I'm going to read the scripture one more time. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And gave herself, himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless in this same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies he who loves his wife loves himself I'm going to add 29 after all no one ever hated their own body but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. How do we know, how do we know that our wives are holy because they are part of the body of Christ and Jesus Christ is holy? I love you guys. I'm so excited.